I appreciate the response. Appreciate you guys talking to me this morning. Hope you guys are are with me today. I hope your hearts are open to God's word as as we dive in. Look with me at Acts chapter 9 this morning. While you're looking there, I want to tell you guys a story that I heard several years ago. There was a lady who really dreamed of going to Europe. I mean, that was her dream trip. Stopping off first in London, then Paris, then Rome, then on to Vienna. I mean, man, that was her dream. But the thing was, she was taking care of her mother at the time. And also, she had a cat by the name of Lucy that she loved very dearly. And so she just felt like she couldn't get away. But finally, her husband assured her, Hey, look, I can take care of your mom, and I can take care of Lucy the cat. Listen, you need to go, and you need to live this dream. And finally, she agreed. She hopped on a plane, and and she went to London, and she spent several days in London, and then she decided she better call home and, and kind of check and see how everything was going, and she did. And she asked about how everything was going. And her husband said, well, honey, I've, I've got some really bad news. And she said, well, what is it? And she said, well, Lucy, your cat, well, Lucy died. And immediately, man, she started cry, you know, crying uncontrollably. I mean, she just loved this cat. And, and she was just so deeply hurt. And then after a while, finally, she kind of gained her composure. And she said, you know, honey, she said, that was just rude. And her husband said, I, I don't understand. And, and she said, you were just so blunt. And he said, well, well, tell me what you mean. And she said, well, when I called you in London, you know, you could have started off by saying, honey, hey, listen, Lucy has jumped up on the roof and I can't get her down. And then when I arrived in, in Paris, you could have said, listen, honey, Lucy jumped off the house and I think she's hurt herself. And then when I arrived in Rome, you could have said, listen, I I had to take Lucy to the vet, and and the vet decided that she had to have surgery, and and well, it's just kind of touch and go now. And then when when I arrived in Vienna, you could have said, listen, honey, I hate to tell you this, but Lucy just didn't make it. And the husband said, oh, okay. He said, okay, I I see what you're, you're saying there. And she said, well, she said, don't worry about it. She said, how's mom doing? And, and there was this long pause. And he said, honey, he said, your mom's up on the roof and I can't get her down. <laughs> now, let me ask you guys a question this morning. How many of you would say that you've had to have a conversation with someone that you really just didn't want to have? Because you knew it was going to be really, really hard, but you had that conversation anyway because you knew the importance of that conversation. Anybody? Right now, we're in a series on encouragement. And one of the things that we've learned in this series is encouragement is motivating others in the direction of Jesus. It's not just saying some nice words, but it's motivating others in the direction of Jesus. Now, if that's true, then encouragement is not just for Christians. Correct? Encouragement is also for those who have not made that decision yet. And I can tell you that this conversation, and I'm talking about the conversation of telling people about Jesus, can be very tough at times because of where people are. But it is a conversation that is too important not to have. Look at Acts chapter 9. And to kind of set the context for you this morning, 
This is the story of Saul who later refers to himself in Scripture as Paul. But Saul is a Jew. And Saul um, is extremely disturbed by this new movement. In fact, he refers to it as the way. And, and you can just kind of, um, you know, hear people refer uh, to Christianity that way. They, they think they have the way. And, and here is Paul. He hates this movement. In fact, he wants to do away with this movement. And it's not because he didn't hear some really good things about Jesus. And, and you know, it's not because he didn't know a lot of the good things that, that Jesus did while he was here, but the reason he is so upset about this movement is because he has no room for a dead Messiah. I mean, to, to him, that is a heresy. And here they are, they're claiming Jesus as the Messiah. And, and, and he is claiming, no, Jesus is dead. And so he feels like he can't ignore this movement. He feels like, in fact, he's got to get rid of it. And so he begins to arrest and torture and even execute Christians. And he didn't even just do it in the city that he was at. He was so obsessed with this that he decided that he also needed to go and do this to the Christians in Damascus, which was over 150 miles away. And this is where his story picks up. Look with me at Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. He's on his way to Damascus to persecute more Christians. And it says, as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. And he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Now let's stop right there. You know, last week we talked about the power of prayer and how prayer is so encouraging. In fact, I encourage you guys to think of someone and pray for them and then send them a text or maybe an email or write them a card telling them that you had prayed for them. But you know what? If I had to preach that same sermon that I preached last week in the first century, how many, how many people do you think would have prayed for this guy by the name of Saul? I mean, here he is. He is, he is persecuting the church. He's arresting them. He's, he's having them executed. How many people do you think would have added Paul or Saul to their list? But you see, here's the deal. God doesn't write people off as quickly as we do. Amen? In fact, look how God works here. Let's keep reading. Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 18. Notice what it says. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord spoke to him in a vision. And so I want you to, I want you to understand this. I want you to wrap your mind around this. Saul has a vision on the road to Damascus. But, but God isn't just working over here with Saul. He's also now working over here with Ananias. He's working on both ends. Are you with me? And so he has this vision calling out to Ananias, and he says, Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, Go over to Straight Street, to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he could see. Now, the Lord blinded Saul on the road to Damascus. So you need to understand that. And Ananias, when he goes to see him, when he lays his hands on him, he's going to be able to see again. But Lord, exam, ex exclaimed Ananias, I have heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. 
But the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and the kings as well as to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul, and he laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Now again, I want us to stop right here, and I want you to notice something. The Lord sends Ananias to Saul. And then Ananias does something that many times we might be tempted to do, and, and that is to, to remind the all-knowing of some things he might have forgotten. Right? You ever done that before? He, he starts telling the Lord, he says, but, but Lord, I don't know if you know this guy Saul or not, but, but I hear word that he's persecuting the church. Lord, let me tell you about his past. And the Lord says to Ananias, no Ananias, let me tell you about his future. What I want you to do is I want you to go. And let me, let me tell you something. We've been talking about encouragement throughout this series, but I'm going to tell you. Evangelism, telling people about Jesus, is one of the most encouraging things that we can do. Listen, we all need to understand this morning that Christianity is about leading other people to Jesus. Are you with me? Christianity is not just about becoming a good neighbor. Christianity is about us leading people into a relationship with Jesus. That is our mission. You see, the gospel can save anyone, and the gospel is for everyone. But here's the deal, guys. We've got to get the gospel out. We've got to tell the good news of Jesus. In fact, look at what Paul says in Romans 10, 13 through 15. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but how can they call on Him to save them unless they believe in Him? And how can they believe in Him if they have never heard about Him? And how can they hear about Him unless someone, what, church? Tells them. Unless someone shares the good news. You see, you and I were saved to be sent. God is going to give you and I opportunities to be someone else's Ananias. And when that happens, God doesn't want there to be hesitation. God wants there to be anticipation. God wants us to get excited about it. Because here's the deal. The gospel, the good news of Jesus is the ultimate encouragement. And some of you may be sitting there thinking, well, well, how so? Some of you may be visiting with us today, and, and maybe you're, you're not a Christian, but maybe you're thinking about it, you're considering it, or, or maybe you guys are walking on, or watching online. Let, let me share with you why this is so encouraging. First of all, because we are giving them the certainty of, e the certainty of eternity. In other words... There is life after this life. Saul realized that on the road to Damascus when he encountered a man who was supposed to be dead, which was, which was Jesus. But let me, let me ask you something this morning. Do you think we need, do you think people would be encouraged by the fact that this life is not it? 
I don't know how many of you remember the beer commercial several years ago. It was usually a setting where some guys were around a campfire and they're all drinking beer. And one of them turns to the others and says, you know what, it doesn't get any better than this. And there are some people who believe that this is it, guys. That it doesn't get any better than it does right now. And, and I don't know what your world, your world is like, but in my world, there are times when, when I don't want to be a part of this world. There are times when things are hard. And I'm telling you, if this is as good as it gets, if this is it, then that is so discouraging. Christopher Columbus, my son Shepherd, was studying him just this week. This is actually a statue that they built in honor of him at his burial. And, and what I would call your attention to is this phrase that they, they wrote down at the bottom in Latin. It's ne plus ultra. And what that phrase means in Latin is, well, it means no more beyond. But Christopher Columbus came along and he proved that wrong. You see, the Spaniards thought that beyond Spain there was, there was nothing more. That the edge of the earth just kind of dropped off and if you went too far, you would drop off with it. That there was no beyond but Christopher Columbus proved them all wrong and so at his tomb it has those words ne plus ultra but now there is a lion and that lion is taking his paw and he is destroying those words because now the people of Spain know and he proved that there is a beyond that Spain wasn't it. And in a, in a very real spiritual sense, we, with the good news of Jesus, have an opportunity to tell people, listen, this isn't it. In fact, this world isn't even our home. We're passing through and we're going to a, a heavenly home that is so much better. The people need to hear that. That the end of this life is not the end of you. And Paul began to, to realize that on the road to Damascus when he encountered Jesus. He began to realize that Jesus had conquered the grave, that death didn't get the last word. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, this is what Paul says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power, but thank God, He gives us victory over sin and what, church? And death through who? Through Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something, folks. People need to hear this. If you're not a Christian today, I hope you're receiving this with encouragement. That let me tell you something. This isn't as good as it gets. There is a much better place. And we'll get to experience through Jesus. But let me tell you another reason why the gospel is so encouraged. The story of Jesus is so encouraging. Because Jesus is willing to deal with our past. How many of you have done some things in your past that you're just absolutely ashamed of? Me too. In fact, after that first point, some of you may be thinking to yourself, well... <laughs> You know, Slay, that first point wasn't really good news. I mean, knowing that the end of, of this life is not really the end, that kind of scares me because of the life that I lived while I was here. I mean, Slade, I've done some really, really bad things. 
And a lot of people have been lied to. They've been told, listen, if you want to go to heaven, then your good has to outweigh your bad. And so there are a lot of people who think to themselves, well, then it's impossible for me to be saved. I mean, if it all depends on me, if it all depends on how good I am, then there is no hope. We're looking at a guy, Saul, who had persecuted Christians. And can you imagine in his mind? I mean, Paul even goes on to, to talk about some of these things, and he even refers to himself as the chief of sinners. But yet, this is what Ananias tells him. Ananias tells him that he can have forgiveness. In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, here you have Paul retelling his story to a crowd. And, and here he's retelling this part where Ananias is speaking to him there in Damascus, and this is what Ananias says to him, and now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and watch, church and wash away your sins calling on his name. Notice what Ananias tells Saul, this murderer, this person who has hauled innocent Christians off to jail. He says, you can be forgiven. Isn't that encouraging? We can be forgiving. Some of you may know who this is. David, I don't know if you know who this is. Harvey Pinnock. Okay, um, he is a legend in the golf world. In fact, he was one of the greatest coaches, golf coaches of all time. Back in the 1920s, Harvey took out a notebook and he actually kept up with different things. He wrote down different things that he had observed about the game of golf. And that was one of the things that made him so great. Well, in 1991, at the age of 90, his son took this notebook full of all this priceless information to a writer, and he says, do you think anybody would be interested in this? Well, the following day, this writer calls Harvey Pinnock, and Harvey wasn't at home, so he left him this message. He says, Simon and Schuster is very interested, and they are talking about a $90,000 advancement. Well, Harvey never called him back. And so one day, the, the writer, he saw Harvey Pinnock, and he went up to him, and he says, Hey, he said, you never called me back. And Harvey explained, he said, well, he said, you know, I talked to my wife and, and we've been having some health issues and we've got some medical bills and so we don't think that we can advance them $90,000. You see, Harvey didn't understand. It wasn't what you give. It was what you receive. Hear this, the good news of the gospel is not just that you can be saved. Every religion tells you that you can be saved. If you just keep these rules, if you're just good enough. But the good news of the gospel is this, you can be saved by grace instead of by your own goodness. In fact, Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says, He was handed over to die because of our sins, and He was raised to life, talking about Jesus, to make us what, church? To make us right with God. Who makes us right with God? Jesus does. And I don't know about you, but that is really, really encouraging to me. That you know what? Even though I've, I've lived a bad life, e even though I've sinned and, and, and I've made mistakes, guess what? My salvation doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't rely on me. I can't save myself. 
but Jesus can. And people need to know that. People need to know that they can have a future in Jesus regardless of their past. That's encouraging. But then one last thing, another reason why this is so encouraging is it offers the promise of purpose. I mean, you look around at our world today and there are so many people who are struggling with trying to find some sort of meaning and purpose for their life. And so many times what they'll, they'll try and do is, is, you know, because they can't find this meaning, they medicate themselves in trying to buy stuff and obtain stuff. Or, or maybe they, they turn to alcohol or drugs or, or, or maybe it's, you know, just television or, or sports. But they're trying to find some sort of meaning and purpose to this life. Because for most people, when it comes to meaning and purpose, basically this is it. I want to get to retirement, if I can ever see retirement. And if I can just prolong my death as long as I can, that's what this life is all about. And I'm going to tell you folks, if that's it, if, it, if it's all about just trying to hit retirement and it's, it's all about just trying to extend death as long as we can, I'm going to tell you, that is discouraging. Write this down. We were created... To know, love, serve, and enjoy fellowship with God. That's our purpose. And I'm telling you, when, when we finally get this, when we finally begin to understand this, I'm telling you, it will change everything for you. Because now... Everything that we do matters. It doesn't matter how big or how small. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10? Even a cup of cold water given in my name, it's huge. It matters forever. In other words, when we live for Jesus, everything we do matters. Everything we do has an eternal purpose. Let, let me read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. This is from a paraphrase. I like the way this reads. It says, Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a what, church? A brand new life, and we have what, church? Everything to what? To live for, including a future in heaven, and the future starts when? The future starts now. Ananias goes to Saul and he says, let me tell you something. God has a future for you. In fact, let me, let me tell you what God wants you to do. He, he is going to send you to the Gentiles. He is going to send you to, to kings. He is going to send you to the people of Israel as well to tell them the good news about Jesus. And there are going to be times, Paul, you need to understand, you're going to suffer and you're going to go through hardships in this life. But let me tell you something, you're going to bear fruit and you are going to change the world. And he did. Paul had a future. But it started with one man telling him, about Jesus. And now because of that, Paul has gone on to encourage millions with the message of Jesus. Let me ask you this morning, who did that for you? I'm telling you, some of you wouldn't be here 
if it wasn't for your Ananias. And the question is this morning, who are you an Ananias to? Who are you sharing the good news, the most encouraging news there is in this world? I want to leave you with this story and then we're going to stand up and we're, we're going to worship God today. We're so blessed that God loved us enough to send Jesus and, and we're going to celebrate that today. But there was a young man several years ago who came to me. He told me he was an atheist. He did not believe in God, but he decided he was going to attend worship with his wife because he thought that that would be a good thing and it would be encouraging for his marriage. I said, okay. And, and so he began to attend and he attended for uh, quite a while, and one day, one Sunday, I stood up and I preached on Jesus, kind of like the lesson I preach today. And, and I got to that point where I, I talked about how through Christ we have a future. Our, our, our past can be forgiven through Him. We can be forgiven of anything and everything we have ever done. And after the sermon was over, he met me in the back and he said, did you mean what you said? And I said, absolutely. He said, but you don't understand all the bad things that I've done. I've been in gangs. I have hurt people. I have done drugs. He said, Slate, I can't even begin to tell you all the bad things that I have done in this life. And he said, you're here to tell me that through Jesus, I can be forgiven of all that. And I said, absolutely. And I'll never forget, he looked at me, he said, then I want Jesus in my life. And I took him and I baptized him into Christ and I'll never forget, it was just me and him. And when he came up out of the water, he was just crying uncontrollably. And I put my arm around him and I said, are you okay? And he looked at me. And it took him a while to get it out. But finally he looked at me and he said, yes. He says, I'm just so overwhelmed that God could forgive someone like me. That's the good news. That's why the good news is so encouraging. Is no matter what we've done, no matter who we've been in the past, through Jesus, we can be forgiven and we have hope. And so we're going we're gonna to worship Him today. Um, Daryl's going to come up and lead us in a few more songs. And as I said, we're going to gather around the Lord's Supper. And I hope this brings new meaning to you as you think about His sacrifice, His body, and His blood. The sacrifice that was paid on our behalf. And so let's, let's all stand and sing.